The following podcast is an Embassy Row production. Welcome to a new episode of the Shaken and Stirred Show. I'm Nigel Barker and I'm here with my incredibly funny, at least he thinks he is, co-host Tom Astor. How are you, Tom? I know I am. I woke up the other morning in hysterics. I, I woke up, uh, yeah, I woke up in hyster- hysterical laughter. And I can't, I'm so annoyed, I can't remember, I can't remember why. It must I have literally- been one of those pet ferrets that you showed me that you have now. Ah, they're not mine, they're my son's. Yes, he's, he's invested, he's, he's bought some ferrets. Well, um, ferrets in the bed will make you laugh, to say the least. So they're, not allowed, they're not allowed in the house. Um, but I did go and ask for something quite unusual today, which I bet you've never asked for. And you probably never will. But I had to go to a pet store. And anyway, this woman went and asked the, the woman behind the till for something. And the woman behind the till said, yes, we've got everything in the store. So I waited a bit. And anyway, she left. I started talking to this woman. I said, so you're the woman who's got everything in a pet store. Well, I would like a harness for my son's pet ferret. And? And she led me to the back of the store and produced a little mini harness for his pet ferret. <laughs> she actually did have one. But anyway, so, um, yes. Have you ever asked anyone for a ferret harness? I haven't asked for a ferret harness, although we have got a cat harness before. And I've recently been on the search, check this out, for an iguana harness. My son's pet iguana, Rocky, is now four feet long. And although I have a custom cage for him, which actually costs, and I shouldn't probably say it, but it's, it's, it's really expensive, actually. It costs thousands of dollars to have built. And a guy came in from somewhere in the middle of America and built this extraordinary cage for him. It's, he's just so big, he needs to go for walkies. So um, we're, looking at, we're looking out for a, an iguana, a Cuban rock iguana harness. If anyone has one, let us uh, know at the Shaken and Stirred show. Uh, you know something that's great? So you're walking your iguana and I'm walking my ferrets. I mean, there we go. Who would have thought, Nigel? Who would have thought? And on that note, what are you drinking, Tom? Um, well, finally, I'm always whining about the weather and when I speak to you, because we have weather and it's never very nice here. And we, we're at the end of the summer, and finally today, it's a beautiful, hot, sunny day. So I found myself drinking cider earlier. And I thought, well, I'm drinking cider, but I've got to do a podcast later because obviously the time difference is, you know. So I just had to make a cider cocktail. Um, I did some research and I found a rather good basic cocktail, which I then didn't follow. I mean, I completely changed all the ingredients on it. I went for a cider and gin cocktail. So you can drink this the summer or the, or the winter. It, it works both ways. Two ounces of gin, half an ounce of lemon juice, half an ounce of simple syrup, and topped with your favorite cider on the rocks in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, like a tumbler, which is what we call it. I changed the gin for vodka, the simple syrup for sugar, because the simple syrup had wasps in it, the lemon juice for limes, because I've run out of lemon and still use my favorite cider. And I've got to say, it is extremely, and with a garnish with a little bit of apple, it's, it's extremely good. Look there we you. go. And it's, you're, you're being serenaded by your grandfather clock. I love it. Or is it a grandmother yeah. clock? Can you hear that? I can hear a little ching, ching, ching. Guys, in, Tom is in England. We didn't announce it this time. For all of you who are new to the Shaken and Stir show, Tom comes from Oxford, England, and I am in New York. So there is a bit of a time difference. And our guest, well, we'll find out where he is when we speak to him, but most likely Los Angeles. So this is an international show, but as we say on the Shaken and Stir show, it is five o'clock somewhere. And I am celebrating with one of my favorites, the Negroni. But I've, I've just sort of been, you know, we've had a Negroni or two on the Shake and Stir show, but it's been a minute, it's been a while. And since I first had them, when I very first started drinking them, I went with the traditional one to one to one, which is gin to Campari to sweet vermouth. It's very simple. It's a classic cocktail, guys. It's one of the oldest in the world. It dates back hundreds of years to Count um, Negroni and, and all the rest of it and his Americano. There's all kinds of great fables. However, I personally, although enjoyed it, have always found them a bit too sweet. And it's the vermouth. So I've been you know, experimenting with vermouths. I actually really love the one made by Ransom, which is what I've got in here. But instead of putting one to one to one, I do one and a half gin, 
I then do a half of the vermouth, and then I do a one of the Campari. And that, folks, is the NB shaken and stirred version of the Negroni. So if you like it a little stiffer, a little stronger, and, uh, you know, less fruity, this is a little, a little stiffer and a little stronger. Well, luck. Thank, Cheers, God, God. thank God this is a cocktail podcast. Chin chin. Um, chin chin. Uh, oh, I was in Oxford last Thursday. I took a picture for you, actually. Amazing. Look handsome as ever. Cocktail, cocktail I had, which is a, which is a, Negroni, it's called a Negroni Rosso, so it's like a Kaiparoska Negroni, so it's got cachaca in it, um, which I suggest you also do an experiment with. You know, think about cocktails, you can do anything you want, just, just mix the taste, right? You can sit there and go, this is a this and this is a that, but really, mix it, you can do anything you want. Um, these guys in this rather good restaurant in, in Oxford had, had created this uh, Negroni and added cachaca, and it and it was really, I mean, it was, it was very sweet, but it was, it was unbelievably delicious. What, so, what is Kinshasa? Cachaca, it's that um, Brazilian, uh, you know, um, it's like, a, you know, they use it in, um, what are they called? You know, where you muddle that, where you, where you crush the mint. Oh, really? Is it yeah. a mint liqueur? Oh, a mint no, jelly. Yeah, no, you can use it in that. You can use it, you can literally put it and crush mint into it. It's like, um, you know, what's it called? Mojito. There we go, a mojito. That was that was like weird. That was like Nigel's like alter ego speaking. It's that like was the Nigel voice of feminine. God. That was your feet. feminine voice came out. It was amazing. It came out without your lips moving. Mojito. Mojito. <laughs> uh, yes, quite exactly. Thank you, Anna Marie. Thank you, Anna Marie. Uh, uh, the voice of God has spoken, people. There, you've heard her her voice right there. Now on to some booze news. A little booze news before we get to our rather hilarious guest this week. Um, well, if you haven't already heard, there is, and we're all very excited for it, a new Bond movie coming out. So cue the theme music. We're probably going to have to pay that much, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't do that. Probably we can't afford it. We can't afford it, people, but we can't afford to miss this either, because Bollinger is doing a special with the new Bond movie, and Shaken Not Stirred, don't forget, that is where we got our name, but we are Shaken and Stirred, sorry Bond, um, but in, in celebrating No Time to Die, the new Bond movie coming out, they have done a collaboration and they've created this fantastic 007 Bollinger, which really is very similar to the regular Bollinger, except it has 007 and his car on the cover of the actual thing. And they've actually got the 007 logo instead of the Bollinger logo on top of the, the actual bottle. And uh, it'll retail for $79 and will go on sale globally starting September 1st. And look out for the movie, which premieres in October, I think October 8th. So, No Time to Die and uh, is the name of the movie. And I no, can't Jason, I, once again, once again, I, you know, got a, a, a button here. But, I mean, you know, it, it's, that's just awful. It was a bit like when BMW started doing product placement in that Bond film, in the Bond franchise, um, because they bought Aston Martin. Um, James Bond's favorite champagne, as anyone who's ever watched a Bond film will know is Tata or Tattinger. It is not Bollinger. I love, by the way, Bollinger is my favourite champagne. Absolutely bar none, I love Bollinger. It really is my favourite champagne. It was not James Bond's favourite champagne. So, what a pity. So that, in fact, is, in fact, the booze news. The booze news is that Bollinger is not his favourite champagne. It is, in fact, the favourite champagne of Shaken and Stirred. Shaken, yeah. not stirred, likes Tattinger. Get oh, yeah. it? Get it right, people. Our guest today is tall, dark, and pleasant. Some may even call him manly. And by some, I mean himself. Please welcome the hilarious, the brilliant, and humble comedian, Pete Lee. How are you, Pete? I'm doing wonderful. Nigel, it's so great to meet you. Tom, it's great to meet you as well. Uh, man, uh, you're uh, you're a handsome guy. I'm a straight guy, but like even just on this podcast right now, I'm looking at you going, "Am I?" You know, like, like you're a very handsome dude, and wow. you add in that, and you add in that accent. It's just unfair to other men. I know. Nigel's always doing that to me. It's I can't. It happens all the time. He's always saying it. Um, tall, yeah. dark, 
full dark and pleasant. I'm like, literally, if someone ever said that to me in a fucking podcast, I would just go, literally, no, I just fuck off. I mean, tall, dark and pleasant. Seriously, what we know what tall, dark and handsome. That's what's written <laughs> down on the, on the notes that you sent through. Jesus, why yeah. change it to pleasant? I mean, it wasn't honestly. my fault. <laughs> it's the name of his Showtime <laughs> show. His show sorry. is called Tall, Dark and Pleasant. It's on Showtime. It's his damn special, for goodness sake. It's my damn special. Yeah, I am. I'm pleasant, uh, which like, I wish, I mean, I don't know that I'm not handsome, but uh, I'm definitely pleasant. Like when girls, when women look at me in bars, they're like, oh, he's pleasant. You know, <laughs> like like no woman looks at a guy and goes, oh man, he'll he'll really rough me up with his pleasantness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then there are there are women though who go, who do who do go for bad boys, unpleasant. You know there are those what you know. So I guess I don't know. Yes, you're right. There is no one sits saying exactly. He's gonna like really God, you know, but scared yeah. of his pleasant. I'm pleasant. I wear a lot of black t-shirts, so I look like I'm just gonna give women a blowout in a salon. That's what I look like. <laughs> I just look like that guy that does the blowouts. That's what, or or the hair washer in the salon. That's what I'm like. FYI, I can't tell you how many, I work in the fashion industry, I can't tell you how many hairdressers are in fact straight male. So there's this oh, yeah. idea that hairdressers are gay, and there are obviously plenty of gay hairdressers, but there are also plenty of straight hairdressers out there. And I, I think a lot of people in the fashion industry are always like, you know, beware of the hairdresser, because you think he might be gay and you're getting changes, the models are in the background, but actually they're oftentimes straight. So <laughs> FYI, uh, they could hit on you. F so. FYI, yeah. They're, well, I mean, I it, you, it's crazy. I cut my own hair and then I also cut my friend's hair. So speaking of that, uh, you know, uh, my and my dad uh, was an interior designer, decorator my whole life, uh, which that's also another field that my dad had to deal with the stigma of, you know, whatever that was. Um, and, you know, my my dad had many gay friends growing up and I grew up with a lot of gay men around me and uh, they're the best. They're the absolute best. Uh, I had no but, idea uh, but, that you had cut your hair. Yeah, I cut my hair. So uh, I it, it's funny, my girlfriend, um, she's staying with me in California right now. And uh, she's like, you cut your own hair. I go, yeah, do you want to do you want to watch me? And she's like, I can't tell if you're either talented or you're a, an insane person, but I'm going to watch the haircut and I'm going to see. <laughs> and what did she say in the end? What was her conclusion? Both. She was she was really happy with the haircut. And she's like, wow, you really know what you're doing. And I, I, know, I know how to. How did you do the bath? Sorry, literally, because you, it looks like a really great haircut. Uh, how how do you, how 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 do you how do you do that? How do you do the back? I mean, obviously mirrors and stuff, but I mean, how long did it take you to master that? Well, there's some kind of real, well, there's some car crashes. Yeah, there were uh, there were a few times where I just had to buzz the whole thing, you know, where where I made one mistake right over here, and then I was like, well. I'm, I'm buzzing it short this time. And then my friends all knew that I cut my hair. So if I showed up to the bar uh, to have a pint with them or whatever, they and I had buzzed hair, they'd be like, oh, you screwed up. <laughs> like, this is hilarious. And uh, But no, I, it, I've been cutting my own hair since I was 19. And uh, it started out out of a necessity of just not having enough money in college to get a haircut. And so, uh, and I'm, I'm 44, so I went to college in 1995. So when I first started cutting my hair, I bought this Conair hair clipper kit from CVS, which came with a DVD that you could watch. And the DVD was only five minutes long because they're like, you can rewind and see this. And then they taught you how to, you know, fade it and cut the top and do all that stuff. And uh, I was pretty terrible at it at first, but I just would cover it up with hair gel. You know, I'd like fix it with pomade. And uh, over the years, I got I got good at it. And I got good to the point where now I cut a lot of my friend's hair. And, uh, you know, so they'll come over to the house and, you know, and I, I sit them down in a chair. I, I put a little tarp over the chair so that I'm not collecting hair for the next two years. Uh, and, um, yeah, I, cu I cut my friend's hair. So they went from, like, making fun of me about it to being like, hey, man, seriously, can you give me a haircut? If I wasn't doing stand-up comedy, I probably would. I probably would be a hairstylist. I I have a knack it's, for it. It's quite good to have a to have a you know fallback plan in case the first one doesn't work. Yeah, especially that. during a global pandemic. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but my whole everything went away. I mean, with you guys, TV production went away too for a long time, and uh, 
there was a period of time where, because I've been doing stand-up comedy for 23 years and then, and I had never missed more than two days in a row of going on stage. And then all of a sudden it was eight months of nothing. And I'm, I'm lucky that I'm, I'm smart and I saved my money and I was able to, I, I just, I got a beach house in the Palisades and just surfed every day basically is what I did. I treated myself to a pandemic. And, uh, but there was a time where I was like, am I going to, am I going to be cutting hair? Like, is this going to be my new thing? Do I need to go get my hours in so I can get licensed? Maybe that's what's going to happen. Well, that Conair, uh, whatever, trimmer that you bought, those things it went unbelievably out of control during the pandemic. Everyone was cutting their own hair. I'm not sure if you noticed, you couldn't buy one for love or money. All of those trimmers, those, the, the, you know, the buzzers, you, they, they were sold out and, and back on the market for like three or four times the price. It yes. was like a sort of heyday for, for people doing their own hair at home. And, you know, I've got a buzzed head. I went and bought what, two of those things. I think I spent north of $500 on the things, which is unbelievable. Yeah. And there are different levels of them. Like I just bought a really nice clipper kit, uh, like like a, a real nice, like to, to get your level of, of detail in there, like you need a really good one. You really like it does matter. You can't just have the fourteen dollar Con Air this isn't one. A level of detail. This is called balding. <laughs> when you bald, that's not yeah. a line. level of detail. Well, you do detail. Detail. That, I look like I got run over by a lawnmower, that, for God's sake. That's the most <laughs> polite. So that is one of the most pleasant ways of describing a, 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 a widow's what's it called, a widow's peak that I've ever heard. Well, there you go. Tall, dark, and pleasant is our friend. So listen, before we move on, we've completely just jumped straight into this conversation, but what are you drinking, Pete? Uh, so I love Macallan Scotch. It's my favorite, favorite thing on the planet. I think that this is made out of angel spit. It is so delicious. I think, I don't even think it's an alcohol. I think it's a vitamin. I take it as a supplement. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely amazing, which my, you know, my whole comedy is all about being kind and sensitive. So you wouldn't think that I'd be a whiskey on the rocks or a whiskey neat drinker or even a scotch guy, but I just love it. Uh, years, years ago, one of my best friends who owns a club in Minnesota, Acme Comedy Club, he loved whiskey. It was the 20th anniversary of his club. So I actually took a scotch drinking class uh, where I went to it, they, they ease you in. Cause when you first start drinking scotch, it tastes almost offensive to your senses. So he would do scotch and ginger ale. And then he moved us like scotch and soda. And then we went to scotch and water. And then finally scotch on the rocks. I got a big rock and, uh, and then scotch neat. And it took me about a month for my palate to adjust. And then ever since I went from that point uh, of adjustment, I, I really don't like to drink uh, that much other alcohol. Well, nah, that being said, I go, my girlfriend and I, my girlfriend, Nicole, will go out to dinner and there will be a specialty cocktail. Um, I love mixology drinks, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and I, I will have one of those, but usually my second drink, I go back to the Macallan. And Macallan, especially the 12 year, it, that's a great drink. That's one of the top ones up there, in my opinion, as well. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, I... I had been mentioning McAllen on a lot of stuff uh, in promo of my special. And then McAllen sent me a bottle of, of McAllen 18. And when it arrived, they sent me a little note. And so it was like, hey, Pete, congratulations on your special, Tall, Dark and Pleasant. And then they sent me a bottle of 18. Well, my neighbors, we, we're all very close in this neighborhood. And I texted them. I'm like, the, I'm like, the McAllen 18 came. My, my publicist told me that it might be coming. So they came over here. And within maybe 30 minutes, we had drank the, the McAllen 18. I mean, this is a number of neighbors. Uh, and, but we had just, we had all had two glasses of it. And my rep was like, well, you should go out to the ocean point that you live at and make like a nice post with the bottle of McAllen 18. Uh, like, hey, full bottle, pouring it into a glass. And I was like, well, that's going to be impossible because it's gone. I'm like, that's how much I love. And McAllen 18 is something you're supposed to savor. And we guzzled it. And she goes, that's actually an even better post to be like, hey, McAllen, you sent this to me 30 minutes ago. I loved it so much. This is the bottle. <laughs> oh, I can oh. see what's happening right here, oh. though, Tom. Can't you? He's, no. doing a, he's doing a commercial for his McAllen. He wants no, more. No, he's doing hey, it live no. on our show. <laughs> hey, McCallum, the kind of like, the, the, you know, the kind of bigging up I'm doing for your label, you know, is so typically Scottish to say, well, 
we must send that very funny comedian over on the West Coast a <laughs> bottle of a bottle of eighteen year old Macal. Just the one bottle, though, mind. We don't mean to send it too much because you know this. It, this I mean, it's always God. That's mean. Why didn't they send you a fucking case? I mean, it's outrageous. Yeah, Which come is, on, come on, Macallan, get step it up a bit. Jesus, one bottle of eighteen year olds. Come on, how, seriously. How long is that going to last? As you said, thirty minutes. I mean, yeah, come on. No, Pete, I think we need to call Balvini. That's what I think. We need to yeah. get them on the case, you know, and we'll see what's happening. I know that Ransom do a good one, too, so we can check them out. Yeah. I, sure. Hey, hey, McAllen, guess who just became a free agent? I am, yeah. I am, re, I am recruitable by other scotches now. That's uh, Glenn, Glenn <laughs> Fittich. Oh, oh, Glenn Fittich is on the phone. Hold on. They're, oh, they have a case. The only, yeah, the, the only case. problem with that, the only problem that is my sweeping statement did refer to Scottish being, people being mean. Um, <laughs> So I think we'll find that Glenn Finnich is also out there as well. So you might find they'll send you a little mini bottle. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We need to move over to the Jamesons. Come yeah. on then. We're going Irish. They'll send you a case. <laughs> oh, I love that. By the way, mm. I, so I just got a text. I just got a text from my girlfriend who's in the living room. And every time that I do a podcast, it's a tradition where she knows that when my phone lights up, I'm going to see it. I'm going to see her name and I'm going to want to check it. So every single time that I'm on a podcast, she tries to distract me and it's tits. And so I just wanted to bring you guys in on a new podcast tradition. Okay. Wow. All right. Uh, so she Wait a second. That- she showed you, a, she sent you a photograph of her tits. Of her tits. Uh, and she does this every single time that I've been doing a podcast or a TV show or any anything where I've been promoting my special. She sends me tits. And in this particular photo, because she knows the subject matter of your show, she sent her tits with two mini bottles of champagne over the nipples. That's, I mean... Wow. I think wow. I'm. I hey, think I'm getting so, married, you guys. So in a minute. So in a minute. I'll tell you what we're gonna do. I've got it all worked out. In a minute, you can just like stop. You can wander in there and go. Well, that was pretty good. You know, that was fun with those guys. Anyway, <laughs> listen. I've got to jump on another. I've got to get on another podcast now. Down a minute. <laughs> tell you another one. We can get another picture, like two for one. <laughs> I'm just always doing podcasts. I'm like, hey, anytime the door to my office is shut, I'm gonna be on a podcast. So I'm gonna need some more sexy pics. That I, I'm impressed by the creativity. Um, one thing that I've done on on previous podcasts, and I know um, I know we have uh, we have the the meat of the show to get to. Um, but one thing that I always try to do when she does this is we try to write a response to her back. What would you, as two witty gentlemen, what would you say that the response should be back to her? Um, well, first of all, uh, without my immediate reaction is she's just popped my cork twice. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> but, um, I think that's the winner. I think that's the winner. All right, uh, you. Yeah, just, I can't even uh, say what I came into my head, but yeah. Twice. <laughs> I think that could be again, too. We can't say what went, what's just gone into your head. No idea. <laughs> really that, you've you've literally just made me wittier than I already am. Uh, she's gonna love that. That's going to oh. be absolutely mm-hmm. amazing. All right, so let's talk about this, Mister Funny Man. I mean, you know, what for you? What, what defines it? What defines funny? I mean, I, I think that's something which, in a way, is a question of, of the ages. But, you know, you just said that you, I just made you funnier than you are. What, what is funny? Um, it's, it's interesting because I think that there, there are two different levels to it. There's, there's people who are naturally funny who haven't refined their sense of humor and honed their craft, and which most of my friends are. George Carlin used to say the funniest people – the funniest people in the world aren't the comedians you know. The funniest people are your friends, and I guarantee it. So listen to them and write down what they say, because you can probably use it in your set. Uh, in terms of going from being just like a funny person who has natural wit to a comedian, you know, we're we're basically figuring out how we can structure uh, structure things so that they they hit even harder. Um, we're whittling down a funny idea to the bone and then we're, you know, releasing that. And we have to be able to go up in front of an audience with, um, you know, no, no band, no other people on stage with us and just stand and deliver with a microphone and have <clears throat> our words be funny. Uh, oftentimes to a crowd that is looking at you like, Hey, I'm comfortable if you're uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. So, um, and one of the, one of the most necessary pieces to that is you want to figure out your comedic point of view. 
uh, you know, most comedians like Rodney Dangerfield was like, I get no respect. Uh, you know, Jeff Foxworthy was like, you might be a redneck if my comedic persona is basically just how much it sucks to walk through life and be a kind person. And um, it's like, it, it's kind of, I, I'm almost strangely or oddly kind and uh, almost o obsessive compulsive about it. And it used to be something that I would always try to hide. You know, I, I tried to hide that I was sensitive. Um, I tried to hide that I was kind. I tried to be cooler than I am. I almost have the, a voice in my head of like a Midwestern housewife in a way, you know, like my, my friend, I saw my friend Esther the other day, she had on this sexy dress and my brain was like, Oh, isn't that ever wonderful. And uh, so that was the thing that I always tried to hide. And, but is that um, kind? That doesn't necessarily that, sound kind. That sounds weird. <laughs> it sounds weird. Yeah. Or, or, sounds, I mean, I don't know. I mean, what's kind about that? I mean, surely it would have been kinder to say, I, you can refine in that dress. No, no, that dress suits refine. you. You can just put it in psychological speak and you can refer to yourself as an empath. That's probably, is that, is that? Uh, yeah, I think that that's a way of saying it. I have a swollen sense of empathy and I, I never want, I don't want to offend. It's kind of all under this umbrella of Midwesternness and um, like kindness, sensitivity towards people. And, but it was always something that I wanted to hide because I didn't feel like it was necessarily the most masculine of traits. And um, now I, I, you know, as I've gone through a lot of therapy, I, I actually do realize that being kind is max is very masculine. It takes strength to be kind. Um, but there's a saying in comedy. Who told you that? that um, I think I read it on an internet meme. I think I think I <laughs> I want to say that I read it in like some deep book, but I think I saw an internet meme that said it take it takes strength to be kind. And uh, and I was like, oh, I'm going with that. Uh, but uh, a lot of times what your comedic persona or your point of view is, is really the thing that when you're, when you leave the house, you're, it's the thing that you're hoping people won't notice. You know, Louis Anderson is somebody who has been traditionally overweight uh, or historically overweight. And I remember his first Tonight Show set is he revealed this uh, comedic point of view in one line. He goes, he goes, uh, I, hey guys, I can't stay long. I, I'm in between meals. And, you know, so he's showing how he views the world as a, a big fat guy and, um, you know, to put it uh, unkindly. Uh, but, you know, that that's something as a comedian, you have to go out and immediately you have to you have to tell the crowd like what your comedic point of view is in a very concise uh, way or like an opening bit that works. And so it's, it has to make them laugh. They have to see how you see the world. And then every joke. Um, you know, every joke is a setup and a punchline. It's sort of like a funny riddle. So you take them in one direction and then you twist it and you go in another direction. And, but at the start of that, you have to like tell them your comedic point of view, then you have to tell them the setup and then you have to hit the punch and then there's taglines after that. So that's kind of the, um, you know, the, the structure of a bit, uh, you know, if, if I'm giving like a little comedy class or, um, I guess since we're talking about drinks and ingredients, those are the ingredients to a bit or a joke. Love it. It's, it, it's the foundation for all that. I mean, for for for, for comedy, as you say, is is self-deprecation a kind of like a fundamental, you know, element to 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 big to comedy. I mean, is that because what you just described is is that something that runs throughout? I mean, is that something that's that's fun? You know, yeah, powerful? it's. You have to be self-deprecating. Um, there's, uh, I forget who came up with this rule, but they call it the rule of shitting. And the rule is that if you shit on yourself first, you can shit on anything else and the audience will accept it. But if you just go out and start shitting on other people and other topics, people will get offended by it. So one of the, one of the main ways, everybody right now is afraid of being offensive. They're afraid of being canceled, whatever. But it, as you know, as a comedian, if you don't want to offend people, you need to first degrade yourself so that they realize that you're coming from a place of humility and then they'll accept you making fun of something that might be in their spectrum of personality or experience. Interesting. No, it's, it's, it's fascinating. But now, it, there are comedians surely out there who go with the who are offensive and i mean that's just their stick too i mean it's sort of they as you said they come out and they let the audience know their point of view and that can be just that i'm an extremely grumpy offensive guy 
And that in itself can be funny, right? I mean, I, I wonder too, you know, is it easier as a comedian to be say offensive than it is to be kind? Because it seems that being offensive is, is shocking. And so the shock value adds to the sort of the, you know, moment and perhaps would make you laugh nervously giggling perhaps because you've thought it, but you've never would dare say it versus kind is something which it seems perhaps less shocking, more easy, and not doesn't seem like hilarious. So how do you yeah. make kind funny? Well, that was something that I really had to go through and and figure out because uh, you know I I was a Midwestern comedian and I was kind of doing comedy on instinct and um uh and then I moved to New York City and I was around a lot of mean comics you know I was around a lot of comics that their their whole persona was I'm the worst and everything is the worst and then I started to try to adapt that style of like well if I'm in New York now maybe I need to be a little edgier and then I would go up on stage and the crowd I would be like so like here's a mean joke and then the crowd would be like eh, nope we don't we're not buying it and they hated me and then I finally had to I, I remember I told a joke that was from the opposite point of view it was, it was just like uh, it was a true story because I noticed that when I walked down the street in New York City, I would say hello to everybody. And people in New York don't say hello to each other. And uh, so I was, I was like, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm Midwestern. Uh, I, I go, um, these were two jokes back to back that were true from that day. I, I go, I go, sorry if you don't like me. I'm Midwestern. And I know you don't understand my personality. But I was like, I'm the guy that like waves goodbye to taxis. You know, I'll be like, bye, drive safe, text me when you get home later. And then while I'm walking down the street, I'm like, just saying hi to everybody. And I'm like, hi, and people are like, no, <laughs> like, like, no, don't do that. Like, you're scaring me. And um, I, I did those two jokes back to back one night. And it was like, I had an epiphany. I was like, okay, um, if if the if the point of view of I'm the worst is funny, then the photo negative of that of I'm I'm nice I'm overly nice I'm ridiculously kind uh, that has to be funny um, uh, in uh, in a lot of and so I was trying to look at the what the photo negative of a lot of I guess the the most successful typical comedians were and I'm like how can I flip that and make that my point of view um, one of the areas that I studied in comedy a lot. Um, I have a lot of friends that are very successful uh, urban comedians. And one of the big points of view in that community is, is I don't trust nobody. And so I was like, well, how funny would it be if I trust everybody? You know, like, cause I kind of do, I'm very trusting. I'm like very naive and trusting. And so like even that, so in studying, in trying to figure out and engineer how I can be myself and then translate, translate that to a comedic, uh, you know, persona or format, um, I needed to boil it down to what the technical ingredients of it were so that I could make sure that my thoughts fit into that. And then it was consistent. Um, like a, a recent joke that I've written that fits that I've been opening with it lately where I I'm like, I'm like, Hey, I'm like, I'm a Midwestern guy. I'm nice. I love people. I love them. Um, I go, so like during the pandemic, I've been wearing my mask underneath my nose just so people come up and talk to me. And like, you know, people will come up and be like, sir, you need to. And I'll be like, thanks for making a difference. And it's just a conversation starter. And uh, the crowds have been loving that because, you know, everybody's afraid to let their mask slip underneath their nose. And I'm doing it on purpose just because I want human contact. So, yeah, it's, it's one of those things where um, like a lot of times on a, on a show, like I was at the Comedy Cellar in New York all last weekend. And a lot of the comedians are like hardcore, hard hitting comedians. And then I go up as like a change of pace guy where all of a sudden the audience goes, what is this? This is like, they don't, they're, they don't really know what, what's different about it, but it's a little bit delightful and it feels different. It's very self-deprecating. And, um, and I'm still tackling, you know, I'm still tackling hard subjects uh, in my special tall, dark and pleasant. My first bit is about the time I tried cocaine. Like I'm not a hardcore guy, but I tried it because I want to have all the experiences in life. Um, but I, and I thought that I was going to like rob a liquor store, but instead I was like, geez, Louise, you know, <laughs> like, 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 let's go volunteer. And uh, so like, like me on cocaine is just more like me even nicer. And uh, you know, so, so yeah, it's, it's a thing where I like to, I like to take subjects that comedians have tackled 
previously. And then I like to put my, you know, my spin on them and it, it's, it's fun to me. And it, it, <laughs> I'm still laughing about that. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Uh, the let's go volunteer <laughs> yeah it's so absurd it just but i can just i suddenly had a visual of people volunteering doing lines of coke and just yeah. being the most another cup of soup let me give you another cup of soup yeah. and it, and more and the person just, just like overwhelmed by this sort right. of really nice zealot <laughs> yeah it's it really is um Oh. Yeah, it, it really, but my person, my whole personality, people look at me like, like, wow, he's on mushrooms, you know, <laughs> like I'm a, I'm an odd person. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it just, it, it just is what it is. But, um, but I'm, I'm happy that I figured out my comedic point of view. I'm happy that I figured out how to engineer jokes and, you know, that I get to, I get to share it with people, you know, my, I feel like as the most masculine thing that you can do in life is to find your purpose. Um, you know, you've both found your purpose. I we're we're three people who are lucky enough in life to have found our purpose, and uh, that's not something that a lot of people have. A lot of men have jobs, but they don't know their purpose, and they're not following it. And my purpose is to bring happiness to people, and to also hold up a mirror to people and go, "Hey, if you're if you're a little bit like me, it's okay. Uh, like like you're you're okay, man." You know, <laughs> so funny because you you literally one of the things I wanted to ask you was what is the purpose of comedy other than to make people laugh? Yeah, I uh, in college, I went to the University of Minnesota and I actually took a, a course called comedy text and theory. And it wasn't it wasn't like a traditional comedy class. Uh, it was just it was on the subject of comedy because we've all heard of tragedies. We've all heard of dramas um, and a comedy is, uh, you know, I mean, going all the way back to, you know, like Shakespearean days and even beyond that uh, it. So a tragedy means that you're like a community is broken apart. Right. So you tell a story. And at the end of the story, if the story is a tragedy, um, everyone, everything is left in shambles. The, the people that were together in the beginning of it, the transformation is that they are now apart. Um, a comedy uh, is the opposite of that. Um, maybe the whole community is in shambles. You go through the story, you get to the crescendo, and then everybody's happy and it comes back together. And you have a happy ending where people are coming back together. So in, I think it's Latin, um, comedy the the word comedy comes from the words comos and logos which literally means bringing people together and so uh, it's it's interesting because talking about a lot of those edgy comedians i think that they are bringing people together kind of through bitterness you know hey can we bond on bitterness and can we can we just all agree that this sucks and that's how they're bringing people together and my comedy is kind of bonding based upon happiness and communal experiences. And um, another difference just to bring the last subject and the subject together is comedy is emotional. Um, there, there, I used to, I studied improv at the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater in New York City. And they basically said that if you have a funny punchline, you can make somebody laugh for 30 seconds. If you, if you make the whole situation emotionally charged, you can make people howl for 10 minutes. And so uh, a lot of times the reason why comedians are dirty is because dirty words are emotionally charged. You know, if, if somebody stubs their toe and they go, fuck, you go, wow, that's, you can feel the emotion to that. Um, but I also feel like there are different ways to, to accomplish that. So a lot of times in the setup of my jokes, um, instead of being like, yeah, I was with my mom the other day. Um, like I, the setup might be like, do you ever feel like you're with her, your mom and you're just constantly disappointing her? And then the crowd would go, they tap into it emotionally. So you don't have to be dirty, but you, you get to, you know, you get to kind of pull the crowd in with you. And I think that in a way, you know, stand-up comedy is, is essentially like you're, you're going up in front of a crowd and you're, you're talking about shared experiences that are emotional to people. And then they're going, oh, I've, I've thought that too. I've felt that too. And now I don't feel so weird. And that's kind of the purpose of stand-up comedy. It, it's, um, it, it's kind of, in a way, 
and I'm not religious, but it's kind of church for the nuance of life. <laughs> you know, you all, you all get together and you, you sit there and then you feel like a sense of community. hundred percent. I mean, I think that's what, you know, how we pick our friends too, right? It's, you pick your friends mostly by the, the ones who make you laugh and the ones that laugh at your jokes. And, you know, I mean, I don't know how many times I'll say something that's probably crass. My wife thinks it's hilarious. And then someone will turn around and go, that's why she married you. You know, <laughs> good thing you found each other because she's the only one who thinks you're funny kind of thing. You know, but there's a, there, there's a, you know, there's definitely that aspect to it. So, I mean, is this what, is this what happened when, when, when Jimmy Fallon met you? I mean, he clearly heard you, thought you were brilliant and then brought you on to his show. And you've got, you've been on, I don't know, six times now. And, um, you, he, what he calls you a regular, you know, but there was that something about your sense of humor that also perhaps would appeal to his audience at, at his time slot too, because I guess it's like you said, it's hard with a lot of comedians. They come up there and they say things which ooh, is perhaps not PC. And, you know, do you get away with things because you can perhaps PCify something which is perhaps, you know, quite touchy? Yeah. Like I did a joke on Jimmy Fallon and I also did it on my special that it was funny. Um, Quest love, one of the roots came into my dressing room and um, I, I have a bit, uh, I'll, I'll tell you the bit and then I'll tell you, you know, kind of the breakdown of it and why I wanted to do the bit. Uh, so I say, um, I, I'm with my girlfriend and I'm in the bedroom and she's like, Hey, what are you into? And I was like, consent. And I'm like, I'm like, I love consent so much. It's actually the main turn on. Like, like if my girlfriend's like, I want to, I'm like, I'm in, you know, like I, and I go, I love consent so much that I don't even use those credit card chip readers until it tells me that I can you know, like, like every, like if you were trying to, to put it in too early and it's like quack, quack, quack. And I'm like, Whoa, I'm not a bad guy. You know, like I, I'm not a bad guy. I respect you. I, you know, and, uh, and then I go through the whole thing and, uh, that it was funny because Questlove came into my, my dressing room afterwards at the tonight show. And he goes, he's like, that was such a beautiful, timely bit about consent and about, um, you know, like, like there's a whole complicated debate right now about um you know like how how women are feeling sexually how they've felt wronged throughout you know history how things are starting to get better now um and you just like from a very kind fun angle you figured out a way to tell the audience your direct point of view of like always get consent and always keep getting consent and and like consider like be kind to women and consider their feelings and and make sure you get consent again and so it, it's something where if you were to go up on a late night audience and just dole that out, while you'd think that that's a point of view that you'd go, well, duh, it's a, it's a really heavy subject right now, you know, in, in society. And it's always been a kind of a heavy subject, but I figured out a way to make it sweet and cute enough that it was palatable enough that it got through people's defense mechanisms and it landed and then people got the message. And um, yeah, Quest Lover, his real name is Amir. He's like, he's like, that was so great that you were able to do a bit like that on our show. <laughs> and right, do you think that kind of thing? What you're talking about, right? So kindness. I was talking to a friend of mine last night. We were, we were talking about I can't remember what it was, but we both at the same, well, he at the same time was like, kind, just be kind. Like we both had this kind of yeah, all, all one really needs to do is be kind. We both kind of had this agreement at the end of a conversation. I can't remember what it was about. It was about being kind. Now, in the, in, in the kind of old days, as it were, right, you'd have Christianity, you'd be beaten into you by some motherfucker with a root up or some Catholic bastard, <laughs> sadistic priest, you know, would be beating <laughs> shit out of you about, like, you know, be kind and be nice to your neighbour and, you know, and all of this, well, kind of like, you know. Uh, anyway, I mean, you know, religion beat it into people, but that was yeah. kind of... Now, that kind of, you know... Religions, but you know, in certain Western Western society, religions play, play less and less of a you know role, I guess, on on a day to day basis. So you know, these messages are kind of like be kind and like what's relevant, you know, what's important in life. Well, they kind of suddenly there's no structure. There's no kind of like there's no big bully telling you how you should be and what how you should behave. So people, I guess, do you think people are kind of scrabbling around trying to like you know. You've got all this TV going on. People are scrabbling around for identities. They're kind of watching these these housewife shows and shit, and they're kind of trying to identify with people on those. And people don't really know who they are, and they're kind of like start behaving like people they see on television. And like you know, you just lose your identity, right? So, 
when when you describe this guy going to into a dressing room and saying, you know, it's really real, you know, wow, that was a real. Are you standing in for that? You kind of it's, it's like a kind of moment where you're like stand inoffensively standing in and actually giving people the chance to be able to think for themselves. Is that? Yeah, that, that that's a very good way of putting it. And I mean, we are in um, we are in sort of a um, you know, in all respect to mental health. Um, I, I, you know, I've, I've gone through a lot of therapy and I, I respect mental health and, and all that kind of stuff, but not to use a term loosely, but we are in sort of a bipolar society right now. You know, if, if you think about, uh, when you watch the news, um, you know, there's, there's the, the person in the center and then there's two people that argue about a point and, you know, and so it's, it's like the extreme of this point, the extreme of this point. And I think when, I think people are just much more human than that. And, um, you know, and, and also, like you said, it used to be that, that people, you know, sought the guidance of the church. And then now it's more like people are figuring things out. People are reading a lot of different things. Uh, people, you know, therapy is sort of a church to a lot of people. But I don't um, think people are reading. I think the thing is, I think I'm going to hold you off on that one. Because I think, you know, I don't think people are reading, reading a lot of stuff. I think, the, I think the half problem, you know, in the old cathedrals right in Europe, you'd have the West Door and it would be carved with kind of, you know, allegorical you know characters who would basically have a biblical story carved in stone because the people coming in the pilgrimage can't read or write and they would yeah. you got gargoyles and you want to scare the shit out of them and you want to <laughs> like you know you want to terrify them and then push them around in a kind of orderly queue round up the nave and round the altar and you see you know good cowering in front of jesus or whatever it was and then you know you got people with weird fucking smoke going here and hoods and the fucking kkk hoods that you know in the yeah. spanish way you know <laughs> Yeah, but the KKK, there's no yeah. accident. They copy the Spanish Inquisition. These people were fucking real. I mean, they were like terrifying the shit out of people. And it was kind of an oppressive, you know, way of doing it. Now, you know, society these days, I find, I don't watch television. I find, I find television oppressive. I find the news oppressive. Uh -huh. I find politicians oppressive and, and, and depressing. Um, and I find that actually people don't, when you said earlier, you know, people read a lot more, people don't read. I don't think they read. They fit through Instagram. They watch shitty television. And, and literally, it's like, I find it terrifying. I don't find it structural. And I don't yeah. find it formative. And I don't find it, like, forward-looking. And I don't find it optimistic. I really don't find anything optimistic about the way the, the media these days is, is sort of structured and, 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 and operates. I mean, so you in the middle of all this, coming back to what you're doing, so you're the voice of... I was thinking of this earlier, you know, you're the voice of, you're doing comedy, you're doing the opposite of what norm, normally people will sit there and laugh at a comedian because the comedian sits there and says, how, talks about how ghastly something is or how awful something is. And people can sit there and go, oh my God, that's so funny, that's so awful, I know that, oh my God, it's so, but thank God, you know, we would, you know, that's not us, but you know. But to do it the other way around, you're kind of like laughing at being nice, which if everyone's kind and nice, you know, <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, the world really probably would be a better place, right? I mean, you know, yeah. why, why, where's it, where's it, why does it take a comedian these days? I mean, you know, like to, to, to basically be trying to sort of, you know, you're the only, you say that you're one of the only mediums in, 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 in television that, that kind of, that basically is preaching um, civility, I mean, which is what you're saying, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that I think the world is far, full of a lot of hard stuff. And then we're being, you know, to boil down what you said, we're being distracted by a lot of bullshit. You know, like, like you said, we're, we're being distracted by watching housewives argue with each other about, you know, just ticky tacky stuff. And um, yeah, and it, so it's, it's almost like we're, we're being distracted by a lot of the or we're being distracted from a lot of the horrible things that are happening by garbage. Uh, by things that are also toxic and they feel bad. And, uh, you know, to bring it back to the religious thing that you said, like I said, I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, really religious. I think I'm more agnostic, but um, I like, I here's, and I'm, I might piss people off by saying this, but um, I, I believe in love. I, I believe that there is a power in the world called love. And, you know, every wedding that we've ever been to, we're sitting there and they read one of those passages where they go, God is love and love is God. And I actually think that that's 
that's the power that is in the world. Um, everything taps into it. I think every religion is just selling love. Like I think they're, I think they're selling that and the opposite of love is fear. So they use fear to sell the love. Um, but like the power when you're praying and you're literally like praying to the power of love in the world and the love will reward it. Uh, when you talk about people nowadays that are like, I just, I don't believe in religion. I believe in crystals and, and I meditate and I, uh, you know, like I, I asked the universe for that and I used the secret and then it was given to me. I think that's the exact same thing. I think all religions just tap into the same thing, but it's kind of a different, it's, it's different culturally and it's a different way of kind of marketing love to people. And also it's a way to monetize love, um, you know, not just religions, but, you know, yogis and people that sell meditation and all that kind of stuff. But I think it's free. I think the power of love is free and um, you know, I, but that's also the thing that I think is an underlying message in my show is like, I'm just trying, I'm trying, I'm trying to live lovingly. And I'm also trying to like share love with the crowd and making and make them feel that. So even me, like I'm selling tickets to my show, you know, when I do live shows. So even I'm monetizing love, you know um, and, but it's free, it's, it's free and anybody can tap into it. And it really is the, you know, the thing that makes the world go around. And, um, you know, and I, I just want people to, I want people to see that. And I want people to feel it. And I want people to gravitate towards it more often than they gravitate towards negativity, which really is not, it's, it's really not encouraged in society right now. Uh, oh, you know, yeah. we both have that in call. We both monetize love. I mean, obviously love different operations. <laughs> I weirdly found, I find myself, and when I'm not being podcast, I, I run a, I'm in the Cotswolds running a wedding venue. Oh, okay. And, yeah. And every week I have people turning up who, who are in a really great mood, who are full of love and fire, really, here to have a really great time. And I literally have to, you know, it's a great, it's a sobering thing because, you know, you just see the kind of expectation on these people's face. Like you have to stop yourself, you know, saying, oh my God, are their expectations realistic? Oh my God, am I, you know, oh my God, am I encouraging something I shouldn't be, you know? And then, well, that, you know, literally, it's something I grapple with on a weekly basis. I know, I, by the way, I, I really wish I was joking on that one. I'm actually being serious. Although it is. <laughs> You know what's so great about this is that Nigel tonight, we normally have them at the end of the show, we have a thing called Last Order, so he asks us a set of questions. And recently, Nigel's kind of a bit kind of like off piste with his questions. And some of them are like, I'm sitting there going, fucking up, really? I mean, only in America would you actually be able to take a question like that seriously. Anyway, tonight, he asked me to do the uh, Last Orders, and he sent me a list of what he thought I should ask. And I looked at him, and I was like, fuck, it, that's the most ridiculous set of questions I've seen in my life. And I drafted a series of questions for this last orders thing, which is when we kind of put you on the spot and ask you questions. Um, and it's really weird because a lot of the stuff that I've written down, we, you've covered inadvertently. Oh. But, I, but I've, if you see me at all sitting there with my pen going, oh, trying to, trying to read. This means he's going back to the questions that I gave him and he's trying to make an excuse <laughs> for the fact that I gave him these. And so although he's already told me he didn't like the questions, he's now going to revert back to them because you've already answered all the things. But you know what? You have a very funny knack. I have a whole page of questions here of things I wanted to ask you. And you literally went through the questions one after the other in, in certain ways and answered everything. And I was like, oh, this is rather funny. You just and then you hit on that and then you mentioned this. So, hey, you know. But yes, last orders, please, Tom. Do you want last orders? These are Nigel's questions. I was clever about this because I knew he'd try to stitch me up. He's such a bitch. <laughs> um, it's just a good moment to do my... What's it kind is. of weird is literally... You have, we have literally cut, like, covered quite a lot of questions. Anyway, let's go with the questions. Um, and I haven't written all these down whilst you've been on. I wrote these down before, but I had to... Anyway, so... Um, I had no idea what we were going to talk about, so it's weird. Out of the Ten Commandments... Can you do you remember what the Ten Commandments are? But out of the Ten Commandments, which one would you redact? Which one would which one would I redact? Would Wait, can I, can, can I Google ten, can I Google Ten Commandments right now? Because I, I literally all right uh, Ten Commandments. Because I feel like if I'm not trying to go off memory, okay. Um, uh, well, thou thou shalt not kill. Kind of a big one. That's a good one. I think um, the key that. Right. Yeah. I'm keeping, that I'm keeping that one. Um thou uh 
thou shall not bear false witness against thy neighbor. So don't lie about somebody. Um, yeah. Uh, loose lips sink ships. I agree with that one. Covet the neighbor's wife. Uh, I mean, that can be hot. Uh, I've seen a lot of internet videos where that happens and it seems like a pretty good thing. Um, okay. You know, the one, uh, the one that I think that I disagree with uh, the most is you should not take the name of thy Lord in vain. Uh, Cause I, I'm from the Midwest. I constantly say like, Oh my God. And I've had, I've had people come up to me after the show that are very religious and they'll be like, you know, I liked your show, but it was offensive because you said God a lot. And I'm like, I don't think that's bad. I like, I don't, I really don't think that's bad. I think that's one of the only ones that I disagree with where I go. Mm, okay. I think you got it wrong. Good point. I actually a hundred percent agree. I've always thought yep. it's kind of ridiculous. Yeah. I, yeah. The, I, the other ones could be debated, but that one, I'm just like, mm, I, I think like, the others can, can be debated. It's like things like thou shalt not steal. Well, actually, you know, imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. I'll, you know, <laughs> You can take a joke that someone someone's created that doesn't tell it funnily and make it much funnier, you know. So stealing, I think, yeah, that's the best. Anyway, they, okay, well, that answers the question. It's better than Nigel's question of, like, if you're a kitchen utensil, which one would you be? That's not one of my questions, so don't answer it. Um, <laughs> I'd, I'd go with a ladle, uh, just because it's a fun name. <laughs> answered it. You did it. Oh, God, it's so annoying. Like, ladle, if I walked up on ladle. stage and I was... Because it's a fun name. That's really good. That's a really good reason. It's a fun name. I'm a ladle. In the age of COVID and awokeness, yeah. Um, what jokes or joke you know can't be told? Um, can we hear it? Oh my god! What joke or joke? Let me just look at my. Um, I mean, what uh, like in the age of the woke age that you know what joke actually can't be told? Because like you get shot down and can and will you tell it? You know, I'll tell you this. I've been doing a bit about wokeness lately that um, it's funny when I even start to go into it because uh, I'm kind of making fun of, of it. Uh, and by the way, I think that we all need to, like we've been talking, I think that the concept behind wokeness is like, hey, you need to wake up and we need to treat people better, right? Like that's that's the concept behind it. But I also think that within wokeness, there's a lot of people who are bullying people because it's fun to bully people for a good cause. We all we all want to punch somebody in the face, but only if it's because they're harassing the old lady that's crossing the street. You know, like, like it, it, it's like a hero complex. And so when we see something that's an injustice in the world, and a lot of times now it's like an online takedown. What people don't realize is that it's just online bullying, but for a good cause. Like you're actually just spitting venom at people. Um, so I've been I've been talking about that subject, and um, I've been I've been doing a thing where like because lately people will tell me like, oh, well, you can't like that product. Uh, like somebody told me the other day, they're, they're like, I was like, well, I'm gonna go take an Advil, and they're like, you shouldn't take Advil because they actually donate to like they donate to companies and this and that that the money ultimately gets funneled to like the Taliban or like 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 it because it's an international company like some of the money ends up going to those people and I'm like well first of all that's that's insane because all money money is like the ocean it, it flows and some of it's going to go to bad people right but the fact that people are telling me that I can't take a product that makes my sinuses feel better after I surf uh, is insane. And my, my whole thing is like every company or everything that everything that anybody, any of us likes, there was a really terrible person that worked there, you know, um, like, uh, Dr. Pepper is a Southern company uh, that was founded in like the 1920s. Do you think the founder of that was just as woke as other people? Like my friends, they all drink bourbon. And they're all evolved and they're, they're hipsters and they're drinking their bourbon. And they're like, we're just all talking about ideas. I'm like, do you think that the bourbon brewmaster in the hills of Kentucky is sitting there like, oh, my stars, I am woke AF. You know, like, like I, I am all about brewing bourbon and social justice. <laughs> no, he's probably a terrible person. Uh, so like I, 
I, I think that the, to answer your question, I think that the subject of wokeness itself is not even, people don't even, they tighten up when you want to discuss it. Uh, I think the connection. I think there's definitely scopes and traits. I mean, just even what you were saying, right? Some woman coming up to a woman or man, whoever it was, coming up to you saying, don't use our milk because the money gets to the Taliban. I mean, for fuck's sake, they took, the Taliban just over around Afghanistan in two weeks. What do you think they're driving? They're driving fucking Humvees. They're wearing yeah. American fucking bulletproof vests. They've got night no vision. Popping they, Advil. They've got fucking <laughs> yeah. American tanks. They've got fucking Apache helicopters. They've basically got billions of dollars worth of American kit. But don't take out them. Um, yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> don't leave your fucking tanks in Afghanistan next time. Do you know what I mean? It's like, okay, I don't, there's a lot. Yeah. I think you, there is jokes. There is a lot of joke with work. I think that kind of thing is, is really. But so so um, we'll get to the joke and work. But I don't think you could tell a shocking one punch, not punch one liner, because you basically could, if, I suppose you're a stand up comedian, because you could either split a room or just, or just yeah. like a popular person <laughs> well, in an instant. Yeah. Um, now, next question. Nigel's going, oh my fucking God, what's he doing, right? Because his question, I mean, I'm, his, loving I, it. I'm loving it. Go ahead, Tom. Okay. Desert Island. You're going to be dropped on a desert island. Girlfriend's tits or angel spit? And by the way, I made that up while we were doing the thing. That's quite pleased myself, man. That's a great one. Um, angel yeah, spit, I, by the way, Nigel, in case you missed it, is what his ref, what he called McCarran. So. Um, I. I'm sorry, McAllen. I would take my girlfriend's tits any day. I would forego, I would literally forego McAllen forever for Nicole's tits. Uh, no, they, also, the gift that keeps on giving, as opposed to those stingy fucking Scots, they give you one bottle of that literally, the gift that fucking runs out in 30 minutes. Okay. Um, <laughs> you no, get yeah. I'm with you on that. I'm totally with you. That's a good answer. Um, last question. <laughs> Last question, which is which I won't change because it's the nature of the business. Shaken or stir? Uh, definitely shaken. I uh, for a couple of reasons. I think that it mixes things up better. Uh, I I also like it when bartenders do the, this thing. It's like a dance that they've learned. I think it's really fun. I also think that anytime you order a mixed drink in the shaker. There's never just one cocktail in there, and I'm what they call a volume drinker. I always like it when they'll leave the shaker for you, and you can pour even more in there. Uh, I do think that stirred is fun. Um, I like uh, that little tool tool called a, a jigger. I like I like jiggering a, a drink. Um, so fan of fan of stirred, but I would go shaken over stirred any day. Yeah, I think okay. the jig is actually the measure. And the, oh, it the, is. Yeah, and the stirrer is just a spoon, but it's okay. Oh. No, it's not. No, it's <laughs> not. Drinking, you're drinking out of the jigger. It's you're the, drinking out of the jigger. You muddle uh, it. It's a muddler. No, muddler is different. Muddler you, is a big stick that you squash everything with. It's a completely different. That's what he was talking, he was talking about. Uh, I don't just... think so. I think he's talking about the little the thing you actually stir when you <laughs> do a stir drink. This is the fucking problem we have. These days. and this, by the way, talk about that kind of the US. British divide and humor. I mean, this is the problem I have. It's like, gosh, you know, like literally. I mean, I'm... up as usual, Asta. Once again, the snapper, people. There you go. Last orders with the snapper. And by the way, talk about last orders. Showtime, Pete Lee, cool, dark, and pleasant. Mate, it premiered July 9th, but it, it's still on, right? It's on, and you can, you can watch it where? Um, you can watch it on Showtime anytime or on Showtime On Demand. Anywhere that you can uh, find Showtime or the Showtime app on your phone, uh, it's on their platform. If you go, uh, you know, the menu, you click on comedy. I think mine is the first one right there. Uh, I've been oh, very... Me. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've been very lucky that um, the special has been performing uh, very well. I feel... I, I'm, I'm very proud of it. I, uh, it's, you know, it's literally a best of my work. Uh, up until I taped it this year. And uh, I think it's something that just like we've been talking about will bring a lot of people joy. And um, also if, if people want to follow me um, on Instagram or TikTok, I'm at Pete Lee, Pete Lee, Pete Lee. It's my name three times in a row. Uh, you, if you just type in P-E-T-E-L-E-E, -E -E, it will come up. Um, uh, but yeah, I, uh, I would love it if people follow me on Instagram. If they're looking for tour dates, they can go to my website, PeteLee.net. And, um, but yeah, please check out the special Tall, Dark, and Pleasant. Pete Lee, Pete Lee, Pete Lee. There you go. <laughs> Follow him. 
<laughs> in everything he does. Thank you so much for being so fun, so being so kind, being so pleasant. Um, God, I hate that word, pleasant. But you know what? It, 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 all of a sudden, it's coming around. I'm coming around to it. Um, what a pleasure! Really, really fun, guys. That was the Shaken and Stirred show, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you very much for listening. That is Shaken and Stirred. We will be back next week with another podcast and another fantastic guest. And uh, stay safe. See ya.